Hey what's up guys, today I'll show you a horror film, Ghost Stories. Spoiler ahead, watch out and take care. The film begins with video clips of Goodman, happily celebrating his bar mitzvah with friends and family, while his strict and religious father is at the corner, watching them. Soon, Goodman's father's strictness will tear their family apart. After finding out that his sister is pregnant with an Asian man, Goodman's father throws his sister out of the house. This caused Goodman to be a professor many years later, and a debunker of fraudulent psychics, to stop people's lives from being ruined by their strict and religious beliefs. He is now famous, and a television presenter devoting his life to his work. He exposes another so-called psychic in front of a huge crowd, saying the psychic has an earpiece wherein his team feeds him information about an audience. Before the show starts, this scam is known. The audience is asked to write their personal information on a piece of paper, and the person they wish to talk to or connect to. Then, the team will steal this, search for more information about the audience, and feed it to the psychic. The audience or the victims will believe everything the psychic says, because the idea of dying, especially to a loved one, is so devastating and awful. Bearing with a messy beard, Goodman idolized a well-known but beardless paranormal investigator, who debunks paranormal experiences. The investigator is known for his phrase, the brain sees what it wants to see, which has been Goodman's motivation to continue his work, However, one day, the investigator who spent his life explaining away mystery cases, became one himself as he disappeared without a trace. One day, Goodman receives a package from an anonymous sender. It contains a picture of the investigator holding today's newspaper, his notes, a tape, and a record player. Goodman listens to it, and is shocked to hear the investigator's voice. The investigator does not explain why he disappeared, and instead invites Goodman to come to a caravan park, specifically Caravan 79, where he is staying. Goodman comes to the address without many questions, excited to meet his beardless idol. However, as he steps into the caravan, he is disgusted, and almost wants to puke from the investigator's lifestyle. Goodman dismisses that because he is in front of his beardless idol, the sexy man who changed his messy life. However, the investigator rudely dismisses his shitty praises, and gives him a folder containing three cases of supposedly real supernatural ghost sightings that he cannot solve. The investigator begs him to help investigate these cases, and tells him that he is wrong, that there is always an explanation for the paranormal phenomena. Goodman leaves the caravan, overwhelmed by emotions, as things did not happen as he expected they would be. As he looks back to the caravan, he sees someone standing behind the investigator. Goodman dismisses that, and investigates the first supernatural case, Tony. Goodman immediately notices that Tony has drinking problems at the first meeting, so he uses the money to force him to answer his questions. The first part is more about his personal life. Tony's wife has died because of cancer, and his only daughter is in the hospital, suffering from locked-in syndrome. It is when a patient is aware of their surroundings, but cannot move or communicate as they are paralyzed. Tony has stopped visiting his daughter, because he cannot stand seeing her in that state. But it only makes him guilty. Then, they jump onto Tony's experience. A flashback kicks into the time when Tony worked as a night watchman, in a disused asylum for women. It is late at night, and it's Tony's shift. He's drinking tea while listening to a radio program, when suddenly the power goes out. Tony gets out and replugs the wire, turning back on the electricity. As he returns to his spot, he finds his cup of tea sitting at the door, confusing him. Tony dismisses that, turns off the radio, and waits for his shift to end. But then, the power goes out again, so Tony gets out to fix it. However, he finds the wires unplugged, and some scratches on the machine. Although confused, Tony replugs them, turns on the radio music, and does his checking round in the building. Everything seems normal, so Tony puts down the flashlight and smokes a cigarette. But then, the lights in the hallway go out, and Tony hears some footsteps. Tony immediately takes the flashlight and lights the hallway, where he sees a little girl in a yellow dress, standing there. She quickly vanishes, so Tony immediately returns to his office and radios his coworker. But instead, he hears a little girl's voice, calling him Dada. Right then someone bangs on the door, so although scared, Tony opens it. Fortunately, there is no one outside, but Tony hears some noises downstairs. Tony follows the noise, which leads to room 92, where the little girl shows up again. She walks toward him, holding a dead bird, and wraps her arms around his waist. Tony can only let out tiny breaths of air, as he is paralyzed from fear. Back to the present, Goodman interviews Tony's priest about the incident. Goodman argues that for Tony's experience to be considered real and serious, it must have a piece of material evidence, because Tony has so much emotional baggage. This offends the priest, as he believes that things and experiences like Tony's should not have evidence, and will not make people disregard and question their beliefs. 
Goodman then moves on to the next case, Simon, a teenager. Upon meeting him, Goodman notices that Simon has an unhealthy relationship with his parents. They pretend that their son does not exist in their lives. Goodman follows Simon upstairs to his room, full of posters, pictures, and books about demons. Simon shares that he's researching demons, because he knows he was not hallucinating when it happened. He knows that it is real. He wants to straighten out everything, because he is tired of people thinking that there is something mentally wrong with him. Simon shares that he was driving his dad's car, but he failed the driving test. He was too afraid to tell his parents about his failure, so he pretended that he had passed it. A flashback plays to the night everything changed for Simon. He's driving late at night into the woods using his dad's car, when he receives multiple calls from his parents. They are mad and disappointed, after discovering that Simon lied about getting a job and his university. Simon tries to explain, when he accidentally runs over a creature. Simon immediately stops the car, panic has stricken him. As he gets out, fear strikes him too, as he discovers that the creature resembles a goat demon. Simon immediately returns to the car, and drives away when his misfortune continues. He runs out of gas, so he has no choice but to stay in the car. He tries to look for a signal, but cannot get any inside. Although terrified, Simon has to get out of the car to look for a signal. Fortunately, he gets it not far from his car. So he calls his dad's company, and asks them to pick him up. They have his location on GPS, but it will take about half an hour for them to be there. After the call, Simon hurriedly returns to the car, and calms himself down. But not long after, he hears a loud noise from outside. Simon rolls the magazine to defend himself, but when he sees the goat demon pass by his window, Simon freaks out. The creature enters the back seat, and orders him to stay, which he refuses. Simon gets out of the car and runs to the woods, where he witnesses a tree transforming into a monster creature. Simon can only let out terrified screams and smelly hormones, as the monster tree attacks him. Fortunately, a help arrives in time and saves him. The following day, for further investigation, Goodman goes to the place where Simon saw the creatures. Although unsettled with the second case, Goodman leaves a message for the investigator. He believes that Tony and Simon's experiences were made, because of their mental and emotional problems. Tony is an alcoholic, wrestling with unresolved grief, while Simon is a teenager with a dysfunctional family, who's at the end of psychosis. Like the investigator said, the brain sees what it wants to see. Tony and Simon are emotionally and mentally drained, and that's why they let their brains play them, and make them believe that everything is real. After that, Goodman walks away from the woods to leave, when he sees an apparition of himself in the car. He is pale as a corpse. Goodman opens the car, and the apparition vanishes. So he dismisses it, and investigates the third and last case, Mike. They are in a field, but Mike is a financier in the city. Mike shares that his wife did not want to have children, unless she was made a partner at a firm. When his wife got a partnership, Mike was so happy, because they could finally have a baby. However, according to Mike, his wife was almost 40 years old, and she was pretty drier than a desert down there. Despite that, they pushed through and used IVF, and soon enough, his wife got pregnant. Right then, Mike takes his shotgun to a more secluded part of the field, before continuing his story. He further says that his wife started spotting after seven months, so Mike took her to the best and most expensive care unit money could buy. A flashback plays, revealing what happened after Mike took his wife to a hospital. Mike returns to their fancy and comfortable home, and goes to the baby's room. It is filled with supplies, and in the crib, there is even a doll in a yellow dress for the baby to play with. Mike wanders around the room, distracting himself from the anxiousness he feels about his wife and child. Mike walks to the crib to hold the doll, when he hears a strong wind passing by, causing some baby supplies to fall to the ground. Mike checks the windows and doors, but they are all locked, which confuses and freaks him out a little. Mike dismisses that and takes the supplies, when he sees another baby supply move by itself. Mike believes that they are the deeds of a poltergeist. Right then, Mike receives a message, so he gives his shotgun to Goodman for a while. As Goodman waits for him to finish his business, he sees a man standing in a hoodie, not so far from them. The mysterious man transfers from the top to front of him, and then suddenly vanishes. But Mike dismisses Goodman's shock, and continues his story. Back to the past, the doctors insist on letting the wife stay for another night, so Mike returns to the house. Actually, Mike does not believe in evil, until that night. He's asleep on the couch downstairs, when he gets woken up by the noises upstairs. Mike goes upstairs, and follows where the noises came from. He ends up in the baby's room, thinking that his wife has returned from the hospital. However, he witnesses and experiences something terrifying, the poltergeist does its work again. 
something is underneath the white cloth, but it quickly vanishes when Mike reaches the crib. The temperature then suddenly drops, killing the fresh white roses and making Mike's breath cold. He then notices someone sitting near the crib, so he backs away, unsure of who it is. The lamplight makes Mike see that it's his wife. She says they are dead, before revealing her ghostly face in front of Mike. He manages to get out of the room, when his phone rings. It's from the hospital, and Mike knows what they are gonna say. His wife has died from giving birth to their child. Suddenly, Mike cocks the shotgun and shoots himself, committing suicide in front of Goodman. Overwhelmed by the recent events, Goodman returns to the investigator and assaults him. However, the investigator suddenly tears off his latex mask face, revealing himself to be Mike. Although confused, Goodman thinks that he is a victim of an elaborate hoax. But when Mike tears off the windows, revealing that there is no caravan of some sort, reality soon breaks down altogether. Mike takes him back to the time of his teenage years, when he watches his bully friends bully another teenager, nicknamed Coward Boy, who is mentally disabled. So the bullies force him to go to the drain to be part of their gang. They instruct him to find the 10th number written on the walls. Coward Boy obliges them, but he soon wants to get out, as the drain gets more narrow. However, the bullies do not let him get out, and threaten to harm him if he does so. Coward Boy has no choice but to continue. But the narrow space triggers his asthma, and the bullies just run away when they discover it. Goodman wants to help Coward Boy, but his fear overpowers his will. So he also runs his smelly ass away from there, leaving Coward Boy's corpse in the drain. Since then, guilt has consumed Goodman, making him like a dead man, because he let his fear overpower himself, when Coward Boy needed him the most. Right then, the decaying body of Coward Boy appears, and he tears Goodman's clothes, revealing that he is wearing a patient's dress underneath. This torments Goodman even more as reality sinks in. Coward Boy laughs like a maniac when he leads Goodman to the hospital, and forces him to lie on the bed. Coward Boy moves on top of Goodman, who has now become paralyzed, and puts his finger in Goodman's mouth before vanishing. It turns out, in real life, Goodman stays in the hospital all the time, with tubes in his mouth. He is actually the one with the locked in syndrome. He suffers from this after a failed suicide attempt in his car. The scene reveals that the hospital staff inspired all the characters and events that he experienced. Simon is actually his nurse and has a healthy relationship with his parents. Mike is actually his doctor. They both believe that there is no hope for Goodman to recover and that he will die in the hospital. As they leave, the janitor named Tony shows up with his four limbs and talks to Goodman like he's a normal person. The film ends with Tony moving a mirror to give Goodman a different and new view, which hopefully will give him new and good things to experience and imagine. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.